welcome. This is Social Studies, Voices Across America. I'm Bill Wood. And I'm Peter Goldsmith. And our eager friend with us is George Lindenfeld. He's an expert in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. George, welcome. Thank you. Now, we can say quickly that a psychiatric disorder, the PTSD, uh, that it could be triggered by a number of things. So we can get started here just on the right foot. George, what are some of the triggers for PTSD? Well, certainly with people that serve in war, that is a significant one. But civilian um, can emerge from failure to bond in infancy all the way through adulthood traumatic events that occur through life will affect people. George, let me, let me go back a little bit uh, and ask you about your childhood and trauma in your childhood, because I think it'll give us a lead into why you've been involved in this pretty much for your life. Glad to do it. Um, I encountered my grandfather, who was born in Hungary, and came to the U.S. to avoid being drafted into the Hungarian army. As a little guy, I would ask him about my family, his family, and he would get ashen and walk away and say nothing. Later, as an adult, I realized my grandpa had post-traumatic stress disorder. He lost his entire family. Uh, in Auschwitz, he lost uh, two grown daughters, one to suicide and one to a car accident. This man was burdened with the effects of these traumas throughout his lifetime. I now know that I was drawn to trying to understand this, probably from my grandpa. Mm -hmm. And tell me a little bit about your growing up, George. Where, where did you grow up? And tell me what the life world was like at that time. Well, I was born in a tenement building in the Bronx on the third floor. I remember using the dumbwaiter to get our garbage down. I remember banging on the pipes for the superintendent to give us heat in the winter. Um, it was a nice, cozy kind of environment at that time. However, at 12 years of age, my family decided to relocate out to Levittown, Long Island. I was in the first graduation class at Levittown Memorial High School. This was an alien world to me, and it, it was kind of traumatic in that I had minimal peer involvement. I was kind of a geek and a loner. Hmm. Let me go back a little bit again, and after we hear that and get some idea of why you may have gotten into this, let me ask you about reactive attachment disorder, which you call RAD, R-A-D. Explain that to us and how it affects children and even children today, as we've seen a great separating of families on our southern border. Absolutely. Children are programmed to bond through proximity to the primary caretaker. When that is interrupted through varied circumstances, such as forced separation, that failure to bond has lifetime consequences, leading to varied illnesses, addictions, psychological and psychiatric problems, and ultimately death. People with RAD in general can expect 20 years less out of life than folk without it. Um, George, let me interrupt you for a second here. As we've gone, uh, RAD is different than PTSD. That's what you're telling us? And there are different triggers for the two? Personally, I don't think they are different. They simply manifest differently in the particular individual. Give us, give us a, for instance, George, I know I've seen some of your uh, uh, work with people with RAD. Tell me about how this happens and the fact that they later can be, as Bill questioned, uh, get PTSD. 
Well, let me give you an example of a 33-year-old whose parents divorced when he was three, and they played him off against each other. His worldview became one of, I'm only worth what I can do for other people so that they will compliment me. His self-concept was atrocious. This manifested in the people he dated and he befriended. They took advantage of him. He developed internal rage. We were able to change that even in his adulthood. Okay, you know, uh, let's jump a little bit ahead to PTSD. Talk about PTSD, how it manifests itself, and what it is actually. It is a neuronal circuit default. Just imagine your computer has a virus in it. You try to reboot it, not successful. You take it to an expert who seeks to pull that virus out of the system. This is the equivalency in the sense of what PTS is. I dropped a D, by the way. My combat veterans do not like the disorder aspect of it. So PTS is what you call? Yes, post-traumatic stress. OK. OK. So where, where do we see it? You know, I know you've written several books, and one of them is about first responders. Yes. Let's, let's talk a bit about first responders and servicemen. I think servicemen is easier to understand. God forbid anybody's in battle. What they have to see and go through, I don't think is describable unless you've been in battle. But talk about first responders. What happens to them? Well, imagine being first responder on call, and in that call you find a baby floating in the pool in the backyard. This is right. probably among the worst kind of experience our first responders have when it comes to children. It has the same effect on the brain as being in combat. Flashbacks, nightmares, sleep disturbance, on and on. PTS manifests itself in similar ways, whether you're a civilian or you're a veteran or you're an active military or you are a first responder. George, let me interrupt again here because you keep mentioning first responders and people that are in um, uh, stressful situations, combat or whatever. I have a friend and this kind of triggered the idea with Peter and I, he's just a normal father. And uh, he had his, he watched his daughter die of a, uh, a long illness and he had some problems with that. And the doctor uh, diagnosed him with uh, PTS. Uh, what, it, and it, it wasn't one thing other than the death, but it was an ongoing thing where he watched his daughter uh, uh, die. Uh, can that be a trigger for PTS also? Yes. Perhaps I should explain what occurs when this condition emerges. Good, good. Yeah. It's in the memory system of the brain called the hippocampus where long-term memories are stored. So it's not the experience itself per se, but it's the recollection and re-triggering of it over and over and over again. That's where the problem is. Now, we used to think, and I'm talking about before the year 2000, that memories were stored permanently in the brain. After 2000, scientists have discovered that that is not so. That memory is repeated and altered probably every time it's brought up. The term for the first occasion is called consolidation. So the memory is consolidated in the hippocampus and converted into long-term memory. Each time it's triggered, this could be consciously or unconsciously, the term is called reconsolidation. That's what we're dealing with. So it's an issue of memory, not of the trauma per se. 
so mammals, other species, they shake it off. If they survive the lion's attack, they go about their business just as though it didn't happen. Now, I've uh, George Lindenfeld, an expert in uh, PTS, post-traumatic stress issues. Uh, he had my friend had a problem. He was sitting in the hospital for another uh, issue, and he just disappeared. His wife was with him, thankfully, and she was able to uh, protect him. But he doesn't remember. He doesn't. None of that is. Uh, in his memory from that issue in the hospital. Uh, is that a, a symptom? Is that something that can happen? Is that something that is a uh, part of uh, PTS itself? In general, I'll answer yes. Now, I haven't gotten into how can you alter it? So if that memory is stored in, let's say, the vault in the brain, we need a combination or a key to open up that vault so that it, when it gets restored or reconsolidated, we can change it. And in fact, that's how this treatment I call reset therapy operates. Now, reset stands for reconsolidation enhancement by stimulation of emotional triggers. So I want to activate that memory circuit in the brain. I want my patient to be there, to be in it, as though it were just occurring. I don't want them thinking about it. I want them being in it. From that, I can identify the circuit through the use of a special sound called a binaural beat. There is a frequency to that trauma that is activated. I will first lock in on the frequency and then I will offset it so that it is a different sound, let's say up to 20 hertz is the term to use, in the other ear. This will create that special binaural beat that opens up the vault, permitting a change of the emotional part of that memory. So, but while, excuse me, while we unpack some of that for a minute, Let's, let's stay on this one path a little. Is it possible that uh, people in our generation who might find themselves taking care of both their parents and their children, uh, that these stressors can uh, trigger this, the, the, the trauma that causes the PTS and uh, might find ourselves unknowingly suffering from this disorder? My answer is yes. Caretakers can uh, succumb to this quite readily. That's why it's George, so important they get relief. George, let me, let me go back a minute because you've said a lot of things. Tell me physically what this looks like when you're treating someone and what you're actually doing while a patient is in the room with you? What's happening and what does it look like? Well, physically, I, I would give you a general statement that the individual seems to be far away somewhere else. It's though they are looking through you. The eyes don't have the glow of excitement of life. I call it the individual being in a protect and defend most. They're trying to defend themselves against other potential intrusion of stress and harm. Now, they are wearing headphones like you are. Uh, some of them are sound based, others are bone conducting, which I, I tend to prefer. The reason for that is that vibration gets to the brain 13 times faster than sound itself. Little, little piece of info I've picked up. At any rate, when we tune into the frequency of the trauma and offset it correctly, I have seen major, major shifting in that circuitry, sometimes in as little as five minutes. 
we are resetting the circuitry in the brain back to the way it was prior to traumatization. Now, you and I have spoken about this previously, and you told me there is no verbal communication between you and the patient at that time. It's simply finding the correct frequency without the patient, uh, as we would normally expect to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, doctor, so forth and so on, and you answering, correct? Absolutely. Now, okay. imagine a combat veteran whose buddy blew up beside you. He's not wanting to talk about that. He doesn't have to, but he does have to be in that circumstance again. Generally, my commitment to that individual is when we do that properly, this will be the last time you have to experience the emotions related to that. How do you induce someone to go back into that very painful place? Well, for most of them, nothing else has worked. Generally, I'll have them talk to someone that has gone through the treatment, such as another veteran, to speak to them person to person about what that was like. Generally, that's enough. So are you telling me that if someone comes to your office and asks you to begin these treatments in as little as five minutes with your, and I'm going to use a, a civilian word, with your frequency therapy, your reset, he or she can be relieved of PTS? Potentially. Potentially meaning what? Well, I can't give you the odds of that occurring in uh, five minutes, but I can tell you my pilot study with eight veterans, including one from uh, Vietnam 50 years after, within four treatment sessions, seven of the eight were totally clear of PTS symptoms. Wow. Wow. Our statistician gives us a reading of 99.75. That's pretty profound. Very, very. And, and, and again, I'm not sure if there are degrees of PTS. In other words, Bill mentioned an interesting thing where uh, it's traumatic, extremely so for his person he's talking about. It's not the same as a serviceman being in combat. Does the effects of the treatment, the reset treatment, work as well on a civilian as it would a service person or first responder? Yes. I'm going to give you three types that I'm inclining to group. One is called complex PTSD, and those are the rad kids that have had developmental issues over the course of their life. I'm not going to tell you that four treatments is going to clear up that individual. It's going to take more intensive therapy. Okay. We then have the situation incurred within a traumatic situation such as the first responder coming upon some situation that alters them or the combat veterans experience. The la last one I want to comment on is referred to as delayed onset PTS. You'll see this in aging veterans that are, let's say, in nursing homes. And because of the time that this um, difficulty has ensued, their frontal lobes begin to lose control over the emotional part of the brain. An example is a veteran sitting in the hallway and saying to the aide, you got to get me out of here. The Jap sniper is up there aiming at you. So this fellow has never shown any symptoms of PTS before, and now he's evidencing them. This also happens in people that have retired from very active lives, and then now starting to re-experience symptoms. That's the three clusters I'll talk about. I'm sure I'll be coming on other types of, over time. Yeah, let me ask you, who else is doing this therapy beside you? I've trained uh, maybe about a dozen people. But it's still your therapy. In other words, this comes from you. You are the root of the tree, so to speak. The root of the tree is a fellow named Dr. Frank Wallace, who created this instrument called the BOD, B A U D, and patented it. My contribution is to explore what was it in this binaural sound that made the difference.
that's okay. that interests me to no end because the classic uh, treatment or therapy that uh, we've learned about is someone laying on a couch and uh, right. filling all of the uh, memories out and having someone analyze those memories and trying to re knit what caused the problem. Uh, you're saying that sound can trigger the uh, the uh, memory and uh, maybe remove the memory from where it's being stored and uh, relieve the person of the trauma of this memory? Is that, do I have that correct? It will remove a component of the memory that is not amnesia. It will drop out the emotional piece of it. And in fact, the individual will likely remember more details of the occurrence, but without the emotional kick. That's oh, that's interesting. So it'll clear the memory to recognize as, as an objective experience as opposed to a traumatic one. Is that correct? Yes. For example, wow. part of the brain that gets affected when a trauma is triggered is the communication center of the brain. I'll point to it right here. It's called Wernicke's and Broca. Now, the individual is not able to receive the information as they did before the trauma, nor can they articulate as well about what's going on inside of them. So how on earth are they going to respond to talk therapy when they're not getting it? Huh. Makes no sense at all. That's kind of what uh, an experience I had with a gentleman that I worked with many years ago, a Vietnam veteran. And what, uh, I, the, the biggest case was we saw him with his feet on the desk and he was gone. He was staring into space, wasn't there. What? And when someone tried to, uh, are you okay? He lashed out at them as if he was fighting on a battlefield. And it took a while to re for him to recover that he was sitting in an office and not in a jungle in Vietnam. Uh, and you're saying that your therapy is able to separate that experience from reality and allow him to look objectively at that experience and deal with it on an objective basis. Do I have that right? Yes. Wow. Now, let me talk about another aspect of this, and that's the viral aspect. The family can catch it from really? the person that's the carrier. So the family can be affected. How, George? How does that work? Called secondary PTSD. By being around that person, you come to protect and defend yourself. Your brain circuitry shifts so that you become more isolated from others. You're no longer involved in the community. You don't go to church anymore. You develop secondary PTSD. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. That's, yeah. That just comes, that opens up a whole rabbit hole of possibilities especially when you consider what you talked about at the beginning where uh, the PTS can be triggered by uh, maybe a child not bound, not uh, bonding properly with a parent and that could be generational. It could just roll through a family from generation to generation. Absolutely. There's another aspect that's called epigenetic where it's been found that the genes are all altered and passed on for at least three generations. And that's in concentration camp survivors and 9-11 involved people. Have you ever dealt with any 9-11 uh, people? That's in our lifetime that we can uh, remember. I certainly remember the morning of watching the buildings fall and it never really I don't know that it's ever been in my mind clear that there's people in there, and that was hard for me to grasp. I was born in uh, 
New York City. And I haven't, unfortunately, been provided the opportunity to assist people that experienced that through 9-11. Wow. wow. I don't know about you, Peter, but my mind just comes to a halt there because it opens up so many experiences that I've had. Uh, so, George, it might be that people that we've known uh, and have had bonding problems with might have some form of PTSD, and uh, we've never, they don't know it, and we didn't know it, and it's just been a barrier between uh, us and them. Absolutely. Let's talk about the failure to bond. These folks have difficulty in social relationships courtship, intimacy, all of these issues become major for them. Wow. Wow. We estimate there's about 10% of the population, I would double that conservatively, that have been affected by some emotional thing that has gotten stuck in their memory system. And is blocking them from being the person that they are capable of being. Counseling that I went through personally, this really is becoming uh, personal to me now. Counseling that I went through, I remember in the sessions after three or four weeks, the counselor tied together four or five things that I bought up during the sessions and uh, labeled a problem that I was having was because of maybe some corporal punishment from one of my parents. Uh, is that something that can hang on for uh, 40, 50 years and from the trauma of that one thing have a bearing on everything else that we do? And uh, she was able to tie it together just in conversation. But you're saying that some of that may be able to be uh, addressed through your oral uh, uh, treatment, therapy. Yes. Simple answer, yes. Wow. The talk doesn't remove it completely from the surface. You have some cognitive awareness of what that difficulty was. However, the primitive emotional brain, it's in the limbic system, really doesn't get that cognitive stuff. It works in a different universe. I think this therapy is interesting in the sense that it's so cutting edge that either the person doing it is really breaking new ground, which I believe George is, or the person is a crackpot, which I believe George is not. Uh, but I think one of the ideas of this podcast with us, and the reason I wanted George to be on with us, is because this is a major breakthrough, and even though his sample sizes are small, he's getting phenomenal results, and it would be nice to see and watch as this progresses larger sample sizes and hopefully get the same ratio of, of I don't know if the term is cure or help, whatever, but this is really something I think that's important to everyone and we, we can all agree how many thousands and thousands of people can use this training. And I know George is beginning to train other people and is uh, close to opening a clinic uh, in, in North Carolina where he lives. Yeah, the, the clinic that I'm discussing opening is not related to private practice for myself but rather as a service in Henderson, North Carolina, Hendersonville, to veterans and their families. Our mission is to end PTSD for them. That's what the clinic is for. Uh, we are looking for funds and we'll be seeking grants to be able to do major research, including control groups, placebo, all the stuff that scientific inquiry requires we want to do it right but in the interim 20 veterans take their own life every day mm. every day we don't know how many first responders are doing that 
but there's a lot of them. George Lindenfeld, thank you. Uh, you've opened some doors and, and uh, shed some light on some things that I'm sure is affecting the people who are watching. Uh, I appreciate your work and your effort. Uh, so until we uh, meet again, take care of each other and respect each other. Peace. You can get this podcast. You can tell someone else about this podcast. It's available through YouTube, through iTunes, and through Google Play. Let's hear from you. Let us know what you think so that we can be in community with you. And there is a way to contact us. That's at peter at agnetislife.com or bill at agnetislife.com. That's our email addresses. Let's hear from you. Let's open up the forum.